Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us for our webinar this morning. I'm Mandy Tuna, and I'm the Editor-in-Chief of LAWSA, which stands for the Law of South Africa, and I've been responsible for its publication for 27 years. LAWSA is one of our flagship products. It's a highly prestigious, title-specific work and research tool. It covers all aspects of South African law. We publish, we have more than 160 titles overall and publish eight volumes per year. Today, we're very pleased to have with us the author of the eagerly awaited Lawson Company's third edition title. She will provide a bird's eye view of key decisions that have shaped the interpretation and application of the Company's Act since its enactment. Our author, Dr. Helena Stewart, is a qualified attorney and is currently a senior lecturer in the Department of Commercial Law at UCT. She has consulted with small to medium enterprises on aspects of good corporate governance and structure. Her primary fields of interest are company law, corporate insolvency, corporate governance, insurance law, and legal education. We'll have a short Q&A session after Helena's presentation. So please use the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen to post your questions. Helena, welcome and over to you. Helena? Uh, thank you very much, um, Mandy, for that introduction. Um, I am just, for some inexplicable reason, struggling to find my, my camera now. Um, there. Okay, there we go. Uh, apologies for that. Um, and again, uh, thank you, Mandy, for the introduction. And um, good morning uh, to, to everyone. Um, I must start with two thank yous. Um, first to Mandy and the team for um, incredible uh, support and patience throughout the revision process. I do feel that that bears mention. Um, and then also to everybody today for uh, giving your time and um, joining us. And I, I think I must say that, especially um, in light of the challenges we all now face in, in trying to join anything, um, given, given the realities of load shedding. So, um, yes, a, a double thanks, I think. Uh, Mandy commented uh, generally or briefly about LOSA um, as, a, as a reference broadly, but before we turn to the topic of today, I want to start with a few remarks about the LOSA company's volumes specifically. Um, and um, that is because I, I think it is a very uh, special um, and, and particular uh, text. So the original text for these volumes was drafted by, uh, I think, one of the greatest company lawyers that, um, that South Africa really uh, ever knew, the late Professor Michael Blackman. And subsequently, the um, text was revised by a whole list of colleagues that I hold in, in very high regard. So uh, at the risk of sounding a bit melodramatic, the revision process um, felt a bit like restoring a painting by, by a master. There was the challenge of reviving the text, but also having to retain uh, what made it valuable in the first place. Um, and, and drawing from that, that very rich basis text that, that was in place. So I obviously retain text that clearly remains relevant, but I also chose to retain text that offered insights and context. Uh, for example, I am simply not aware of any general text that has that that deals with the history of South African com company law as comprehensively and with uh, such insight. And so I chose to retain much of that um, and maybe just frame it slightly differently. And, um, and I do think that while South Africa continues to forge a unique path and legislative identity, understanding the roots of the discipline and the context that shaped provisions over time is really vital if we're going to uh, craft and apply legislation to full effect. But that is really just one, um, one example. 
there really isn't, I don't feel, superfluous text, um, but there is some that, that, that offers this, this context, which I think is, is very valuable. Uh, and, and again, I do hope that I was able to strike the correct balance um, in, 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 in this regard. I also want to add that I did attempt to state the law as a neutral position. So where matters were opaque or controversial, the laws of text would opt to refer to more specialist publications, um, such as uh, Henoxburg's com commentary on the Companies Act, which um, really remains, I think, a valuable exposition of finer points um, of law and I think that this approach is in keeping with what I've always found most useful uh, about law so as a reference so that is the fact that it offers a succinct and a clear overview of the position as a point of departure and then it guides towards further reading so um, it, it really is I think a very useful um, general bird's eye view of the law, I still um, run to other law sub volumes whenever I'm confronted with something new um, as a place to start. So um, with that being said, uh, just briefly, an overview of how I'm going to approach today. I've already said um, what I think I want to say about the, the LOSA text and the extent and nature of the recent provisions. Um, I'm then going to turn to the Companies Act um, and look at developments and cases. And finally, I will end by looking at additional context and um, in particular looking at some trends that we're seeing um, emerge internationally. Um, I will add a caveat, I think, before I start. The seminar is quite ambitiously titled Practical Interpretation and Application of the Companies Act. Now, to start, naturally, one must um, just say that this is a very um, vast piece of legislation, and we've had a lot of law or case law on it since um, its enactment. And it's, it's obviously not possible in the time to deal with all of this. And then the second caveat is that I think uh, practical interpretation and application, application is kind of in the eye of the beholder. And it's going to really depend on the capacity in which you're advising. So if you're advising um, as in-house or um, in some other consultative capacity and your focus is on legal risk management or on compliance, um, I do think you will look differently at practical interpretation and application. Um, and, and I suppose it would be more of a preemptive look um, you know, at how to, how to avoid things, um, how to safeguard against eventualities, how to de-risk uh, particular transactions and actions. Um, whereas if one is looking from a, from the point of view of, of a legislation expert or a, um, uh, you know, somebody, I think, uh, jumping in once the proverbial poor poor has hit the fan, uh, you're going to look at it differently. And so that presents a challenge if you're going to try to highlight particular things to, to look at and to consider. And um, I mentioned this because what guided me today is a balance um, to look at cases that I think uh, will be of interest to, to most um, people engaging with the legislation in, in whatever capacity that might be. Um, so with that, uh, I will then uh, start with uh, the substantive um, content of the seminar. Um, and of course, um, the, it's, it's, it's no longer news to anybody that there was, there was a degree of uncertainty that accompanied this piece of legislation um, when it was first promulgated in 2008. Uh, we did keep many of the key provisions of the 1973 legislation, but the 2008 Act did introduce far-reaching changes. Um, and I think one of the, one of the things that, uh, that rattled many people was that we moved in many instances uh, away from the familiarity of our English law roots and embraced concepts and legislative approaches from uh, other jurisdictions. So, so naturally this was this was all quite quite foreign. Um, a lot of this, one must add, was part of a modernizing process. I'll refer to this again as we go along and um, just in step with international trends. Generally, uh, I think this is all old hat. Um, a lot of it also 
um, had been started as a process of piecemeal amendments to the 1973 Act. So um, a lot of it wasn't obviously entirely new. But even where we found provisions or principles rather had been retained from the old legislation, there were often phrases and ways in which, uh, in which it was now redrafted and stated uh, that were new. And uh, we didn't really know how that would play out in the courts. Um, and so, uh, there was, of course, a, a response to some of the first um, uh, ambiguities in, in that uh, set of amendments in 2011, and that did clarify to some extent. Um, but I think, um, again, as I mentioned, this is not, this is not news to anybody, and, and most people will be aware of, I think, what those uncertainties were and how those amendments responded. Um, despite this, a lot of Sorry, Sorry Helena, yes. can, we, can we just check? Are you sharing your slides at this stage? Yes, I am. Yeah, we're not able to see them. So if you could oh, just. Oh, thank you, Josie. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. I, I, I do apologize. And let me immediately correct that. Um, there. Thank you. Right. Is that better? Perfect. Thank you. Thanks. Apologies. Um, Right, so um, to just uh, continue there then, um, what, what I think then remains extremely interesting, and I think this is interesting even on a month by month basis, uh, as the cases are decided and reported, um, is then the, the judgments and, and commentary that is now giving meaning and texture to these statutory provisions. Um, and so it's to a few of these that I am going to turn. Um, and I'm going to start by looking at the issue of alterable and unalterable provisions. And this was quite new and innovative um, on, on the part of the legislature. It's, of course, an attempt to deal with the reality that the legislation governs um, such a variety of, of companies. So everything from your smallest to your more, most complex entity, um, it's all governed by this one piece of legislation. Now, of course, many uh, responses to that in the legislation, um, a framework that deals with it from, from different angles and perspectives. But I think one of the key ways was, was this introduction of alterable and unalterable provisions. So the idea that you have a, a, a list of core provisions and that companies can then opt out um, opt in uh, within within reason, and so alterable provisions, of course, defined as those provisions um, or a provision where it is expressly contemplated that its effect on the company can be negated, restricted, limited, qualified, extended, or otherwise altered in substance or effect by that company's memorandum of incorporation. And an unalterable provision is uh, simply the the opposite of that. Um, bearing in mind, of course, the exception uh, in terms of which you can uh, alter an unalterable provision, provided that it must impose uh, a greater burden on the, on the company, it must be more onerous uh, on the company. And, uh, and so obviously, in many instances, it would be uh, crystal clear whether something is alterable or unalterable. The legislation quite simply states, um, you know, this is uh, the, despite uh, anything to the contrary in the MOI, uh, etc. But uh, one, one could predict from the outset that there would be instances where it would be less clear. And I think Barry versus Clearwater Estates was one of the first cases that really engaged uh, the, the ambiguity there. Um, and I think it's an interesting case for, for a few reasons, and I'll, I'll highlight those. Um, it dealt with the provisions of Section 58, and in particular, Section 58.1a, which tells us that a proxy can be appointed at any time. So um, that then just the exact word of the wording of the, of the legislation. And here we had a memorandum of incorporation that required a uh, proxy appointments to be um, delivered to the company no later than 48 hours before the meeting. And so the question was whether this, um, in effect, was attempting to alter uh, an unalterable provision, which would we know in terms of Section 15 simply render that, that uh, provision void or, or, or unenforceable. Um, and the court here, I think, uh, took an approach that, that illustrates a few things. The first is that 
these matters will often have to be decided on a case-by-case -case basis. One would be able to, I think, have general guidelines, but certainly it is incredibly context-specific. And that, I think, is the second thing that this judgment illustrates. The court looks not only at subsection 1, but then looks at subsection 3, which quite clearly is an alterable provision and considers the role of each of these sections read together and looks again at the purposes of the legislation and, and the wider framework to come to the conclusion that it is an unalterable provision um, and, and that it could not be amended uh, in the company's MRI in the, in the manner that, that, uh, that the uh, founders uh, sought to do. Um, so, so I do think valuable for that reason. Um, and I think valuable in, in looking at these um, more, what's the word, more limited um, or, or clearer, um, clearer instances where, where we have um, narrower instances um, in play. Um, I want to juxtapose that with what we saw in uh, Tuwala versus Grancy Properties. Now, this case is better known as a case dealing with delinquency. Um, and I juxtapose it with Barry because we have here a wider power. So it deals with section 66, subsection 1, which confers that very broad power on the board of directors to manage the business and affairs of the company. So um, we'll know that section, the business and affairs of the company managed by or under the direction uh, of the board of, of directors. And it then very clearly says this is subject to the provisions of the memorandum of incorporation or the act. Um, and and Grancy property here, the court makes quite an interesting statement in this regard um, and, and refers to what it calls shareholders agreements outside the company's founding documents, whereby the parties agree as to the manner in which the company and its directors will exercise powers. So the court concludes that these kinds of agreements don't alter or vary the founding documents, but instead are agreements between the parties thereto, in terms of which they agree as to the manner in which and the purposes for which the powers um, of the company and its directors will be exercised. Uh, the qualification um, that the shareholders agreement may not be inconsistent with the act and the memorandum of incorporation, the court says, deals with situations where there is a direct conflict between them and not with a qualification in the shareholders agreement on the manner in which the general powers are to be exercised. Um, and this may constrain the exercise of that powers. Now, I think this is curious. And again, I simply am going to um, going to state this and not have a strong opinion on it, but I do think that it is curious to see the statement um, against the very broad uh, wording of section 66 subsection 1, which appears to confer um, open-ended powers on, on the board subject quite clearly to the MOI or the Act. Um, and it is difficult to see how one can then frame a shareholders agreement as an instrument uh, extrinsic, extrinsic to these, um, these instruments um, and, and, and able to, to refine these powers in, in the way suggested. I do think that there is an argument to be made that it is done via Section 15, which allows shareholders agreements, and that is something that falls outside of the Act, and so the detail of it is not, in fact, included. Um, but again, uh, I certainly think there is there is unclarity here that remains. And uh, I think speaking of, of things that are not clear, um, that then takes us to ring fence provisions, corporate capacity and turquoise, and, and here are also just a few, um, a few things that I would like to mention. Uh, I want to mention it especially in the context of the turquoise rule, because I do think um, uh, that it is something we saw in, in various instances in the legislation where things that we traditionally associated with common law um, bodies of law, such as the turquoise rule, such as um, veil piercing provisions, uh, were, were codified and um, not uh, codified to the, to the exclusion or to replace the common law. And that, of course, um, raises questions of how the uh, various provisions um, would, would work together, would work in tandem with one another. 
Um, and so there were quite a few, I think, significant changes, not unexpected, um, in that these are also, I think, culminations of a progression that we saw, um, changes to the legislation in this regard. So uh, we know that really the ultra-virus uh, doctrine was almost completely sterilized as far as third parties outside the company is concerned by uh, the provisions of Section 20. And then, of course, also constructive notice was um, done away with in large part. It was retained, though, for these ring fence provisions. And I think ring fence provisions um, are, are, are not as um, odd a thing as they once were. Um, we've also had some guidance from the Companies Intellectual Property Commission as to when it is appropriate to make use of these and that they should really ideally speak to issues related to capacity and authority. Um, but it was still not clear how this new statutory turquant was going to interact with the common law turquant. There did seem to be some nuanced changes um, in, 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 in terms of these two. And here I think uh, the court in One Stop Financial Services versus Neffenson gave some very useful guidance. Um, and I think a very um, clear uh, summation of, of how it will work. Uh, what I think is particularly noteworthy about that uh, judgment is the way in which the court explains the interaction between the, the common law and the statutory turk uh, noting how the statutory turk is not going to undermine the body of case law that's developed in terms of the, the common law turk and that that still remains useful authority um, and guidance. Now, of course, the court here dealt with the fact that to make use of turquoise in the first place you need to establish authority and you're going to have to establish authority um, either because there is actual authority or because you are um, successfully able to argue something like uh, ostensible authority or estoppel um, and the case was decided before the judgment in Makate versus Vodacom and I'm not going to engage uh, that judgment I think it falls ever so slightly um, outside of the, the scope for the discussion um, today. Uh, and, and, and I do also think that it is a widely reported judgment. So um, people will mostly be aware of its provisions and will therefore be aware that it certainly will impact how we're going to apply these provisions in the, in the Companies Act in that it now, I think, adds a layer of additional, uh, let's call it intrigue, when, um, when we are dealing with uh, ostensible authority or, or, or then uh, Stop all. Um, another interesting codification was, of course, the veil piercing provision, and we find this in section 20, subsection 9, of course. Um, and again, at first, it really wasn't clear if you considered the um, long progression in, in common law in terms of uh, veil piercing provisions uh, or veil piercing uh, judgments. You'll see in the common law, of course, uh, the courts almost uh, veering uh, this way and that as various policy uh, matters were considered. And I do think it's interesting if one looks closely at the cases, while it might appear at first glance that there is inconsistency in the case law, the facts do tend to, um, I think, uh, speak to that. So one, one does then find that, oh, but actually the facts differentiate it um, quite clearly and one can understand why the, the court uh, took the point of departure that it did. Um, and I think what that emphasizes again is that this is a very nuanced area of law. I think it's similar to Turquant. It's quite case dependent. It's quite nuanced. Um, and it's therefore, I think, difficult to, to codify. Um, and, uh, and interesting to see how the courts then interpret and apply that codified provision. So what we found here is um, the, the legal personality of the company can be set aside in instances where there is an unconscionable abuse. That is the term the legislature chose to use. And it's a curious thing because um, we, of course, see that term used in case law. But in the uh, Close Corporations Act, uh, we didn't see that term. We saw the term gross abuse. And there were a few other apparent inconsistencies uh, or differences, rather, let me say, between the um, new codified provision and, and what we had gotten used to um, as the common law position. Now, um, ex parte court, it's a, it's a provincial uh, 
decision, but but I do think it, it offers extremely useful guidance because of the way the court engages it, um, clearly aware of the uncertainties, aware of the fact that it was effectively the first judgment to really come out and engage the, uh, the interplay between these provisions. Um, and the court says, interestingly, that um, unconscionable abuse, the term the, the legislature used here, has less extreme connotations than gross abuse, which is that term we, we find in the Close Corporations Act. Um, and it concludes, interestingly enough, also that the term is diverse enough to cover all of the descriptive terms like sham, device, stratagem and the like used in connection with earlier cases and conceivably much more. So the court clearly here doesn't see it as a remedy of last resort, which is something that came through strongly in the common law cases. And it's very interesting as, uh, if one contrasts it or compares and contrasts it with uh, that very well-known judgment from um, England, for example, Petrodal versus Prest. Now, of course, the fallout after Petrodal versus Prest um, has, has also um, raised questions, and it, it isn't entirely clear uh, long-term what, what the consequences of that decision uh, will be. Uh, but certainly, it seems very clearly that the, the courts uh, in that instance was, was narrowing the application significantly. Um, and here, that seems not to be the case. If anything, it is, it is a widening or a more, more robust uh, approach to it. Um, another, I think, interesting case to note, and this, of course, um, with many of these sign-off cases, there, there's many interesting issues to, to, the, to the single judgment, so I'm going to just focus on one, um, and I'm also going to steer clear of the, of the facts um, uh, here, because that would, that would take quite a while to, to work through. Um, but, but relates to the application of the solvency and liquidity test. Now, of course, again, not news at all that the um, capital maintenance regime was completely uh, jettisoned. Um, again, culmination of a process that had already started earlier um, in steps with trends internationally. Um, and that test, as it was phrased in section four, seemed to be quite objective. And so um, it says the assets fairly valued must exceed the liabilities. And it says that it must appear uh, that the company will be able to pay their debts, its debts as, as they become due, it reasonably appears. But then section 44 and 45 speak to the application of that test in the context of financial assistance. And curiously, seem to import a subjective element in that they say, or those sections say the board must be satisfied that the company will comply with solvency and liquidity requirements. And so uh, there were quite a few um, discussions around whether this is now uh, subjective or objective and what will be the bar or the measure looking back um, in hindsight at these decisions by the board. Um, not the, the, the Trevor Capital case is not actually the first case uh, to deal with this. Um, and another decision, um, I, I think it's Western Cape, if I recall, uh, don't, um, I'm afraid, have it written. Uh, da Cruz, oh, of course, versus City of Cape Town. There we go. <laughs> da Cruz, there's my clue in the name. Da Cruz uh, and others versus uh, City of Cape Town uh, already dealt with it, um, saying, of course, that, that it's not a matter of pure judgment, however bona fide it may be, since the decision maker is required to have regards to the objectively relevant facts and must make a reasonable judgment on the basis of that. Um, and so also echoing um, opinions from Henoxburg here, the court in, in Steinhoff concluding that the test requires something more than a purely subjective belief on the part of the directors. Um, it's a subjective satisfaction based on reasonable grounds. And I think that is um, a, quite a good way to deal with this apparent inconsistency, because it's quite curious to note that we don't find that where the test is applied in other sections, such as section 46 and 48, referring back to, to 46. Um, so, so it was a bit of, of an oddity, um, which, which the court acknowledges in, in, uh, in Trevor Capital. Um, then a few words um, about directors. Now, that I think was one of the more controversial steps the legislature took was this high level codification. I should maybe not say controversial, um, but certainly something that sparked uh, a share of debate. So, um, of course, uh, all kinds of 
considerations weighing into whether you codify or not and whether you should wholly codify or partially and this of course is this high level partial codification that that we've all gotten to know quite well um i mentioned organization and doing tax abuse in another versus me uh, in this context but really of course that case dealt with delinquency orders in terms of section 162 um it was in fact the first delinquency application brought by a party acting in the public interest which the legislation in terms of of its provisions um, that give standing um, allows. And uh, the court here imposed a lifelong delinquency declaration on a director. So I think um, perhaps gratifying given the, the frustrations one has with um, poor governance and, and mismanagement um, and what one sees internationally as well, this, um, uh, I think, move to, to ensure accountability. So um, I think that that is interesting to note. It's interesting to see that the courts possibly will tend to um, apply these provisions quite strictly. Um, I think also of interest in interpreting directors' duties generally is the continuing relevance of the stakeholder debate and, and how the courts will perhaps um, continue infusing the duties with uh, with soft law norms as well and we've seen that in some cases like um kalahari resources like um before even the new legislation still full time gold mining company um and i think that might make for some interesting developments in the case you're there uh, a few words um regarding remedies and reflective loss then um uh, and here again, interesting because we see familiar some some brand new remedies, of course, such as the the appraisal remedy, but then some familiar remedies phrased in in different uh, ways. And interesting to see what what the courts did with those. Um, and here specifically, I want to mention section one hundred and sixty three. I found that quite interesting. So of course, that provision was developed in a very peculiar context um, in 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 English in English law first, and that was to address the issue of quasi partnerships um, and falling out in that context. Very often, turning into these little corporate divorce battles where the company was um, essentially litigated into oblivion as the parties were just throwing everything under the kitchen sink at one another. Um, and so, of course, this is a, a way to try and avoid that, and give the court some foothold uh, to, to prevent it in the best interests of the company and very often relate, uh, resulting in the, the majority just uh, being ordered to, to buy up the minority. Um, and so that was, of course, in our legislation in the 1973 Act, Section 252. And we saw that now in the new legislation as well. Um, but, uh, and this was what the court in Peel and others versus Hammond and JNC Engineering uh, confirmed, there seems to be this continuing intention by the legislature, or not doesn't seem to be, there, there clearly is an, an intention by the legislature to, to broaden relief in, in, in terms of these revision, uh, uh, provisions rather than that to limit them and the court in 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 the peel decision actually unpacks also evidence for this assertion from both the state aims of the legislation but then also from section 163 um i mean it's really quite quite apparent that that section is more widely drafted. I think the question always was whether the courts would sort of lean into this wider drafting or whether they would tend to interpret and apply it more conservatively and narrow the scope. Um, and it would appear that that they are embracing this this more robust interpretation. Um, it is interesting the facts of, of Peel. I mean, this is quite an old case by now. It was decided in 2013. So the facts may be familiar to many of you, but um, this, of course, was an instance where there was a, a, a relatively um, intricate uh, transaction whereby the a South African entity effectively became a, a subsidiary of an international entity, um, and allegations were that that international entity had engaged or had been engaging in BE fronting, and that this was very detrimental to the local entity's reputation. And so, of course, this is not at all the kinds of facts that we would tend to associate with um, with the traditional context of Section 252. Um, and yet the court, the court did apply Section 
163. Um, and, and also the court given very, very broad remits in terms of what is al allowed to do um, and how it can intervene to assist in terms of section 163. And in this instance, used that to quite full effect. So um, undid all of those agreements and cancelled them and, and effectively untangled that entire transaction. So that was quite interesting to see. Um, then another very useful decision, Lumisa Investment Holdings, and again, this was widely reported on, so um, I'm sure uh, not unfamiliar, um, where uh, one essentially had the um, share value uh, of of the company and it was it was um, more than one entity involved and the directors of both the auditor and the company were sued the auditors obviously for for failing to to predict the collapse in the share price and, and liability for that um, and so I'm not going to engage with those um, those broader questions uh, but really just the the core of it so um, it dealt with uh, the wording of section 218 or, or at least clarified uh, to some extent the wording of section 218 uh, which tells us that any person who contravenes any provision of this act is liable to any other person for any loss or damage suffered by that person as a result of that contravention now that section raised questions because of course of the um, traditional or the common law reflective loss rule. And so that reflective loss rule uh, finds its roots in that very, very old decision um, from English law uh, that again, we're all familiar with uh, Foss versus Harbottle. So the idea being the loss is uh, unique to the company, it's the company that suffers a loss. And if we were to allow the company to recover that loss and the shareholders to then also recover um, for uh, de devaluation of the shares, then that would be a double recovery in essence. And uh, so it would be, I think, hugely problematic to interpret section 218 in, every, in, in, in any other way. And I do think that the, the judgment in Lumisa very cogently um, explains uh, why that is the case, um, mentioning, you know, in particular, that there is, of course, that presumption that uh, the statutory provisions are not intended to alter or exclude the common law unless uh, that is done expressly or um, by, national, by, by uh, a necessary implication. Now, uh, the court here, um, I think, also sets out in a useful way um, the roots i think of that common law rule and how it interacts with with the with the section so that you can draw uh, principles of more general application possibly from it um and uh that then brings me to just one or two things around business rescue and so business rescue um I think it's possibly the, it's the area that has generated the most case law. Um, there is just a, a, a plethora of cases here, uh, and it's it's quite impossible, I think, to to pinpoint anyone uh, to to really give give any um, sensible discussion in the short time that is available. Uh, I, I wanted to just refer to um, I think Commissioner for the South African Revenue Services versus uh, Louis Pasteur Investments because it is quite a recent case and I do think that it highlights a point of particular concern which is um, the fact that there has been growing mistrust I think of how these provisions are, um, uh, are applied and I think it's um, ironic and quite uh, quite disappointing because, of course, the whole business rescue regime was introduced in response to the perceived failings of the judicial management system, which, of course, had that exact same problem. So, um, you know, we, we seem to be going full circle on this, and it seemed to seems to just be a perennial problem. What do we do with companies in distress? Um, and I think it's such a difficult repositioning of, of all of these um, uh, uh, conflicts and, and interests um, that it will probably remain a challenge. What this case though um, considered specifically is an instance where the business rescue had been going on for 10 years, there'd been a replacement of business rescue um, practitioners, and the court then allowed standing to a creditor to apply for a conversion from business rescue to uh, a liquidation. And in fact was um, so disappointed in 
in how the business rescue process had been managed that a personal cost order was made against one of the business rescue practitioners. Um, so um, I do think showing uh, what, what may be the start of a zero tolerance to, to these kinds of abuses, because of course that would undermine the credibility of the entire process um, and is something to, I think, watch with, with concern um, and, and attention. Uh, finally, then some context, and here again, um, I'm going to really just touch on these things in relatively broad strokes, because, of course, they are very uh, area and jurisdiction specific. So the trends that we tend to see in the United States and Canada um, are not exactly what we are seeing from Europe, um, Asia, developing economies such as Brazil. Um, but it is very curious to see that there is some universality to the trends. Uh, and I'm, I'm veering here slightly off uh, sort of traditional black letter company law uh, towards more governance type um, issues and, and uh, topics, but I do think it is significant because we do very often find that this is the start of an evolution that eventually will see these things reflected in legislation. Um, I think we've seen that with many of, of King's provisions uh, finally making their way to, into the Act. Uh, and so one big trend, of course, continues to be ESG and, and sustainability reporting. So ESG, of course, environmental, sustainable, um, social, sorry, environmental social and, and governance um, issues and the big problem with with ESG was of course that there are no universal reporting standards and so it really depends on how each company wants to spin uh, a yarn uh, you know whether whether it's now ESG compliant or not um, and really looking at um, analysis of of reporting on on in, on, and in the context of, of South African stock exchange it really there is still a lot of, sort of greenwashing and um, uh, especially in the context of, of I think uh, sustainability reporting um, overstated claims of of, uh, of compliance where, where there really is none um, I think 2020 and or not I think the the certainly the the evidence has shown that 2020 and 2021 pivoted companies quite strongly towards um, emphasizing the social elements of ESG so we were looking more closely at um, employee rights at unemployment at um, economic hardship and the like. Um, I think the um, realities of climate change might uh, pivot us again towards uh, sustainability related issues and risks related to sustainability because of course we're looking now at risks, we're looking at um, things like stranded assets having to be accounted for and all kinds of things uh, related to, to sustainability. Um, and, and we are seeing some um, convergence um, at last with the International Sustainability Standards Board, uh, working on international standards that companies can use as a guideline. And that should be welcome. But again, I mean, the proof will be in the pudding. One would have to see those standards. They're very often um, still, I think, leave, leave room for, for shenanigans. Um, and again, sort of maybe also adding the caveat there that you're on the tightrope all the while, um, not to, to over-regulate and, and, and the like. Um, internationally, we're seeing emphasis on, on uh, human capital management um, that is going to uh, continue. We're seeing, I think, continued emphasis on diversity, equity and inclusion. Interesting uh, developments in um, various jurisdictions, the NASDAQ, for example, now requiring um, representation. And I think here, again, a lot of macro questions around whether this is best legislated, whether this is best left to voluntary um, measures. Um, I think evidence, evidence now seems to, to really support um, the fact that a more diverse board would, would tend to perform better. So um, hopefully we'll see, we'll see some positive movements in that regard. I think it's particularly significant for um, South Africa. And also in terms of board composition, interesting seeing um, Europe move away slightly from uh, that combined chair CEO role. And uh, that's been recommended, of course, by uh, King for some time. So in South Africa, um, we've we've had that that uh, recommendation in place. 
then uh, technology and artificial intelligence. And I think here yeah, there's lots of interesting developments. It's curious because King 3, of course, made provision for a specific IT governance committee in King 4 then um, Jettisoned that, noting that really IT management must be infused into all the company's uh, processes because it is so pivotal. Uh, and so here, I think um, one, one will consider things like the impact of IT risk management and artificial intelligence in how we interpret um, the legal responsibilities of the, of the board of directors. And I think that we will have to be increasingly careful because it can do enormous damage if it is not properly managed. Um, but also, I mean, obviously a company can fall behind if they don't, if they don't embrace it effectively. So I think that is a, a, a new, um, not new, but, but, but increasingly um, a reality for, for company boards to bear in mind. Um, we're also seeing, uh, of course, continued implementation of some stalling in 2020 of things like the shareholder rights directive, um, increased movements on say on pay um, and and um, shareholder activism coming back to the fore after uh, lagging a bit uh, over the or during the pandemic um, that internationally uh, we're seeing some of it in South Africa the question really I think is where it where it will bring us um, and and I think also how realistic it is to continue uh, sort of relying um, as heavily as we are on, on institutional investments to, to, to sort of swing the swing the pendulum more do you know, steer the steer the course of sway the course of the of the boat um and that then uh brings me to i think my time um and and does uh luckily in the time cover everything that i that i wanted to to mention thanks uh very much manny i'm going to hand back to you um and uh my thanks to everyone thank you Juliana for that informative address. To delegates, we trust you found that insightful. A reminder to please use the Q&A tab at the bottom of the screen for any questions you may have, rather than the general chat box. We'll get to these questions in a moment. In the meantime, please do complete the poll on screen, which will be up for a short while. I'm now going to look at some of the questions from our audience, which Leona will respond to. Let's start with the first question. Are any of the trends that we discussed evident in the company's bill of 2021? Leona? Thanks, Mandy. Um, yeah, I'm, uh, it is good to also mention the bill, I think, because um, the bill has been a bit like um, ESCOM's uh, power supply. Now you see it, now you don't. Um, I know it's, it's probably not, nobody's in the mood for ESCOM jokes today. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, the bill was was discussed at length um, and, and in the news a lot, and then suddenly seemed to disappear a bit. Um, and there's some areas that, that are particularly contentious, and this uh, is anecdotal, I don't have personal knowledge of this, um, but especially I think the issue of employee representation on boards that uh, that was considered, um, and executive remuneration I, I understand to be to be relatively contentious now. Um, certainly I think it does reflect some of these trends, um, it especially looks at, as I mentioned, director remuneration, which is something that is internationally on the cards for discussion. Um, and uh, it, it then also, of course, refines uh, some issues that, that have continued to be problematic, um, approval for, for certain uh, shared transactions and the definitions of uh, private companies in the context of um, of uh, fundamental transactions and, and, and all of this is quite sensible. Um, what it what it hasn't done is engage, I think, um, significantly with uh, issues of, of sustainability. Of course, we've got the um, Social and Ethics Committee, and that was was a novel step. Uh, other jurisdictions do you have so, uh, sustainability committees we, we're i think unique in the the remit of this committee and, and its functionality it's quite broad um and and so some subtle changes were made in the functioning of of this committee and so i, I do think we, we see some of it 
Um, and certainly we see some of it to the point where we're seeing it in legislation elsewhere. I think a lot of the developments at, at, the, at present still only manifests in, in the form of soft law and, and, and so forth. Okay, thank you. Okay, we have another question. Does the decision in FUMISA impact the interpretation or application of Section 21A more generally and or impact the interpretation of any other provisions of the Act? Yeah, so the, the court actually made a point of, of saying that it's dealing with reflective loss in particular, and so it doesn't, um, uh, on my reading of the case, um, give sort of a, a, a comprehensive um, response to the the implications of, of section 218. I do think where it doesn't give final uh, guidance, it certainly gives very clear direction um, that, that can be applied. But there are other sections um, that come to mind, such as potentially the provisions of, of some of the provisions of section 20 and section uh, 161. So um, yeah, it would, it, it would be interesting to see possibly later case law apply those guiding principles in, in that context also. Okay, I see there's another question. Um, okay, somebody, an anonymous person, please provide citation for the case related to business rescue. Oh goodness! Um, if 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 we could do that by by email, possibly um, okay. after the fact, I'm gonna I'm gonna have to sort of scramble around now to find it. And my after ten years of the legislation, are any patterns emerging from the judgment that are worth noting? I I think it's it's early because uh, it's been ten years, but it is. I mean, there's it, it's a it's a legislation piece of legislation that just covers yeah. a myriad of, yeah. of different issues um so i don't know that we've got enough i'd be i'd be cautious to start calling it patterns or, or trends yeah. but what i do think is worth mentioning is that we are seeing what i think is a a sensible approach to mm. pulling common law provisions into the statute that tends not to throw the baby out with the bath water, yeah, which I, yeah. I think is, is certainly to be welcomed. Um, and I think some very good examples of, of, of sensible purpose of um, interpretation of, of the statute provisions. Okay, great. And um, let's just double check if there's anything else. Right, I've got that citation. Okay. In the meanwhile, um, am I able to pop something in the chat. Um, let me see, let me try. Are people able to see the chat? Um, yes, they will be able to. I've posted that in the chat. Oh, wonderful. Okay, I've just got one more question. What is the relationship between the King's report and the corporate governance aspect in the Companies Act going forward? Did I say that again? No, I think I got it. Um, so it's, I think it's quite nuanced and, um, and it's a relatively intricate question um, because, of course, King has lived alongside the B Companies Act for a long while. And we do then tend to find or we, we have found some of its provisions uh, of previous iterations of King um, included in the Act such as how we deal with auditors now and so on, that, that was quite progressive. Um, in many respects, King requires more of companies. And what is curious is it applies, of course, to all companies, um, regardless the company's size. Um, and uh, that you know, application is not enforced. It's only enforced in the context of listed entities at the minute. So uh, we've had the cases sort of in Obiter touching on the fact that King may be applied in sort of an indirect manner through interpretation of the director's duties. Um, and I think that raises some very interesting questions. Mm -hmm. um, when that is appropriate, um, whether it is appropriate in the context of your um, smaller entities, medium entities. And I think very interesting in if one considers um, developments in the UK, for example, where some corporate governance codes now, um, or a revised corporate governance code was developed specifically for larger private companies. And we are seeing movements in that space as well. So 
I think it would be curious, I mean, in the context of your listed entities, we already have that enforcement via the JSE. Um, and so I think it would be uh, potentially more interesting to look at the, the space where we have unlisted large private companies um, and, and how it develops there. Okay, thank you. I'm just going to see if there's one more question and then you're going to have to end. Um, no, okay. I think that's great. We've answered, you've answered um, most of the questions. Um, okay, everyone, thank you for your questions. Um, we've reached the end of today's session. We trust that you all found the session useful and look forward to connecting with you again soon. Thank you once again to Dr. Helena Stewart for sharing her insights and expertise with us. Helena, really must be commended for her excellent work on the company's water title, which is meticulously crafted. You can see some information on screen now about an exclusive 40% discount on water, which we're offering to today's delegates, as well as our Black Friday promotion. A reminder that the webinar recording will be made available within a few days. Please look out for it via email. For more information, please do get in touch with LexisNexis on sales at lexisnexis.co.za. Thank you so much and goodbye. <laughs>